preparatory lecture series, which is now a post COP26 round table. And I'm absolutely delighted to see you all here. And it's very lively on my screen already. And this is what this is intended to be about, you know, more of an interactive session. We had this great lecture series before COP, and now we want to explore what has happened at COP. Has it met our expectations? Where do we go from here? And uh, there are many questions, and I think no one holds all answers to all the questions. So maybe today we can find some answers to these questions together. So I'm really grateful for the time you're taking for this, and uh, I hope we will have a few more attendees joining us. But I must also say that for all the lectures, we have record numbers of viewings. We've just had this in the discussion before everyone joined. So we can um, count the viewings on the website, on the playlist of the university's uh, YouTube channels. They are available by CIL, but also by the um, university and by the IUCN. And there you can see that all of these recordings have been viewed between 400 and 600 times. So this is a really good outcome. So there's a great interest um, in this. And uh, yeah, hopefully we will find a way as well of uh, taking this forward into the next year and towards the global stock take. Um, so I'm not going to talk for much longer. My uh, function today is uh, just to guide you through the session. And what we are planning to do is to give a short introduction each between five and 10 minutes for each speaker. And we have one speaker after uh, the other and then have um, pro approximately 40 minutes or 30 30 minutes for questions from the floor. So if you have questions for a specific speaker, please can you post your questions in the Q&A section um, or in the chat, we will have a, an eye on both of these. And uh, then I will read out the questions or you can come in uh, and ask your questions yourself. So uh, that's also possible, but please also type them in because then I can, I know exactly who is coming first with the questions. And so without um, any further ado, I hand over the floor to Lavanya Rajamani, who will introduce some aspects of equity and fairness and what her reflections on this topic. And as you all know, Lavanya is professor of international environmental law as, at Oxford University. Thank you very much, Lavanya. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Petra, for your introduction and also for inviting me to be part of this really stellar series of lectures that, as you say, has been very well uh, taken up and, uh, and, and viewed. And now this uh, uh, inspiring panel. It's my privilege to be part of it. Um, I'm going to speak briefly on what I think are the most significant outcomes of Glasgow and make some reflections also on um, equity and fairness, which was the topic of my uh, talk for the series of lectures. The single most significant outcome of Glasgow, in my view, is the conclusion of the Paris rule book. This is not what the media reportage focused on. Uh, the media reportage focused on, as, as we know, in the immediate aftermath of Glasgow on language around uh, fossil fuels and coal and phase down and phase out. But this, this isn't, to me, the most significant outcome of Glasgow. Glasgow concluded uh, negotiations on the Paris rule book, and this is really the big ticket item from Glasgow. Most of the Paris rule book, um, that is the rules required to operationalize the Paris Agreement were actually concluded a few years ago in Katowice, but some issues had proven intractable. The rules uh, relating to Article 6, so markets around emissions trading, negotiators, negotiators had failed to agree uh, to these rules in Katowice in 2018 and Santiago in 2019, and these were agreed in Glasgow. And with it, the emissions trading market can resume and pick up, and it is hoped to uh, it will generate real reductions at lower cost. The rules allow for adjustments to avoid double counting. They limit the extent to which CDM credits can be carried over, and they also levy a charge, at least on one of the two channels, under Article uh, 6.4 for adaptation. The issue of common timeframes was also resolved in Glasgow in favor of five-year timeframes. Um, and this allows for more dynamic target setting uh, and action, delivery and accountability, as well as greater comparability across nationally determined contributions. And the final aspects of the rules around transparency were also concluded with common reporting formats and tables with some flexibility for developing countries. All of this allows for greater clarity, transparency and comparability. So the completion of the Paris rule book, as I've been saying, is to me the most significant outcome of the Paris, of the Glasgow negotiations, because it signals the start of the full implementation of the Paris Agreement. But I do want to focus, as I signaled right in the beginning, on one other distinctive aspect of the, uh, of the Glasgow Climate Pact, 
Others will uh, focus on other aspects of it. It is evident to me from the Glasgow Climate Pact that the logic of the Paris Agreement approach to treaty design is actually playing itself out beautifully. And in fact, far beyond expectations in relation to mitigation. But it is in this process, institutionalizing unfairness and inequity in the regime. Let me explain this a little further. So the Paris Agreement represented, as we know, a step change in the approach to treaty design that have been taken thus far in the climate regime. So the Paris Agreement's approach is quite distinctive, is to start broad to ensure everybody's on board, but then iteratively go deep. So start with universal participation and iteratively ramp up pressure on states to increase the stringency of the targets that they choose for themselves. The jury is out um, on whether this will actually happen since, it's depend since it depends not on targets and timetables like Kyoto, but on transparency, on normative expectations and peer pressure actually functioning uh, effectively. And it is clear from Glasgow that at least as far as target setting in mitigation is concerned, and I'm not talking about implementation or delivery, I'm talking about target setting. The logic of the Paris Agreement is actually playing itself out uh, beautifully, and in fact, at a stunning rate. First, the goalposts have been moved. So the temperature goal has shifted within the spectrum from well below two degrees centigrade to 1.5 degrees centigrade. That is the focus now and the direction of travel uh, that, that we've set for ourselves. The net zero goal has shifted from its articulation in Article 4.1 from the second half of the century to mid-century. So the goalposts have been shifting. The ambition cycle has been speeded up. And in fact, many of the processes that were created uh, through the Glasgow Climate Pact, to me, are actually replicating elements of the global stock take, which is to take part in take place in 2023. So the Glasgow Climate Pact um, launched a mitigation work program with no end date, unlike the adaptation work program, for instance, which has an end date. It requests states to come back in 2022 with updated NDCs. Some have even advocated, this is not in the Gla Glasgow Climate Pact, but some even advocated NDCs uh, to be updated on a yearly basis until the gap to 1.5 degrees had been, uh, had been plugged. And there are requests in the Glasgow Climate Pact for the Secretary to produce annual NDC synthesis reports. These developments in relation to mitigation, which in relation to mitigation are fabulous, um, need to be placed in the context of the fact there were no substantive outcomes on finance and support, except more process. And even the 2020 $100 billion per year commitment will not be met until 2023. And in any case, this is really not about $100 billion per year, because that is minuscule compared to what's actually needed. The reports the Standing Committee on Finance uh, um, uh, put out suggest we need in the range of five to eight trillion dollars, not $100 billion a year. But this, the fact that this was not met and it was an expression of deep regret in the Glasgow Climate Pact is, is suggestive of the fact that this is totemic of the unfairness that is being institutionalized in the regime ratcheting up pressure on mitigation ambition with no reflection or avenue for consideration of each state's fair share in the context of breach promises on finance and support is baking unfairness into the system. And I can give you a couple of illustrations from the text and I'll stop there um, after that. If you look at paragraph 29, it requires uh, or requests parties to revisit and strengthen NDCs in 2022 to align with the Paris Agreement's temperature goal. But how can every state's or each state's NDC align with the Paris Agreement's temperature goal? It depends very much on what every other state is doing. Uh, we need a clear sense of each state's fair share before we can determine whether we are on track to 1.5 and whether each state's contribution is on track to 1.5. Paragraph 32 encourage, encourages states to embed net zero in Article 419. Uh, long-term strategies, and this is certainly a good thing. And it talks about just transition to net zero emissions, of course, another positive uh, element of, of this um, text. But just transition does not capture the distributional issues between states in relation to the mitigation burden. There is no ref reference to different peaking years, unlike in Article 4.1, where there is a reference to the fact that peaking years will be later in developing countries. And so what we're beginning to see is undifferentiated net zero, mid-century net zero for all states. To conclude, 
Um, and these are just illustrations and many such uh, examples through the text. And I'm sure Salim and others will add more in, in relation to baking in unfairness and institutionalizing unfairness in the system. Pushing developing countries to put more and more ambitious targets on the table in the context of limited support is not only unfair, it is also likely to make these targets that they put on the table less credible and achievable. In terms of net zero, long-term net zero targets in particular, for instance, I mean, India uh, to just, and I'll end with this example, India uh, sort of launched the first few days, uh, 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 first few days of the Glasgow uh, COP by putting on the table a 2070 net zero target. We still don't know whether that's a CO2 or a GHG target. And that's, uh, that, those are the questions about credibility and accountability that we start, need to start asking and uh, asking of ourselves. Because if we put pressure on countries to come up with these mid-century net zero targets, in addition to everything else, in the context of no support, you're going to get ambiguous targets, which may or may not be achievable, which may or may not be credible. And I'm not sure that's the, that's the way we want to get on, the tra on track to 1.5. Thank you, I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you very much, Lavanya. That was really interesting and insightful to hear. So we, uh, without further delay, we pass over to Salim, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petra. And thank you, Lavanya, for uh, uh, setting the scene. So let me, um, I'm going to be talking about the topic of loss and damage in COP26. But before I do that, let me just um, frame the reality of the situation that we came to Glasgow under. Uh, the first thing to mention is that COP26 was supposed to have been held a year ago in November 2020 in Glasgow. It got postponed by 12 months to November 2021 because of the COVID-19 crisis, which was a legitimate reason. But climate change didn't take 12 months off. Climate change actually arrived during those 12 months. And I'll give you a precise date when we can trace that. It's the 9th of August, 2021, which was the day that the Working Group 1 Science Group of IPCC's sixth assessment report was published and said for the first time in 30 years, unequivocal evidence of the impacts of human-induced climate change because of the temperature rise by over 1.1 degrees due to greenhouse gas emissions since the Industrial Revolution. They never said that before. It's the first time they've said it, and they are now able to attribute the enhancement of impacts due to human-induced climate change on a regular basis. And since then, we have seen many such extreme events taking place around the world, including in developed countries, that are attributable to human-induced climate change. So we are now living in the era of loss and damage from human-induced climate change. This is something that the vulnerable developing countries together, the small island states, the Africa group, the least developed countries, ILAC together with G77, brought to the attention of the presidency of COP26, told them that this is the first COP in this new era of loss and damage, and it needed to rise to the occasion to deal with that. Unfortunately, uh, the COP26 presidency tried to confine this to a very narrow set of discussions around something called the Santiago Network on Loss and Damage, which was agreed two years ago in COP25 in Madrid and had not been fleshed out. So they tried to make that the be all and the end all on discussing loss and damage. We have nothing against that. It was a good discussion. It went on into the late hours of the night on a few days. But eventually we got some language saying that there will be such a thing as the Santiago Network. We'll have a workshop about it and we'll develop it further in COP27. All good stuff, but it doesn't address climate change impacts and loss and damage. It's just a talk shop doing more research, doing more technical assistance. What we had asked for, and when I say we, I speak now about all the developing countries together. It was a common demand from the G77 countries collectively to have a announcement in the chapeau in the Paris in the Glasgow agreement on creating the Glasgow facility on finance for loss and damage. 
this language was put forward by G77 in China, representing 138 countries and 5 billion people on planet Earth. It was inserted in the text, in the penultimate text of the uh, negotiations on Friday evening when it should have finished, but it went into extra time into Saturday. And by the time we arrived in the venue on Saturday, that language had disappeared. It had been replaced by a Glasgow dialogue on loss and damage. And the vulnerable countries were told that's the best they're going to get. And we understand that that insertion and that change in language came at the insistence of the United States and the COP26 presidency simply succumbed to that pressure from the US to remove that language. And so all we've got is a dialogue. Uh, incidentally, we've done dialogues before. We had something called the Suva Dialogue several years ago on loss and damage finance, and that didn't come too much either. So in my view, that particular outcome was a complete abdication of the COP26 presidency's you know, fairness. They bowed to pressure from the US. They made, they insisted on the vulnerable countries accepting that and the vulnerable country leaders, one after the other, if you listen to their speeches, were tears in their eyes. They were accepting that they were forced to accept the unacceptable in the language that is being presented to them. And they went back completely disheartened uh, from the outcome of Glasgow. Now, there is another thing that happened in Glasgow at the same time, but it didn't happen inside the negotiations. It happened outside the negotiations by our host country, which was Scotland, which is a country uh, with a government and a first minister. And she put a million pounds on the table at the beginning of the COP for a new fund for loss and damage to climate change. And she challenged other leaders to match it. By the end of the COP, uh, the province of Wallonia and Belgium had offered a million euros. A number of foundations have offered a few million dollars. And Nicola Sturgeon doubled the amount that Scotland was going to put in to two million pounds. So we now have a non-UNFCC fund for discussing how to deal with loss and damage finance going forward. And that to me is a very positive outcome from Glasgow, but the credit belongs to Nicola Sturgeon, our uh, first minister of Scotland. And I had the occasion to meet her afterwards and talk to her about it. And she is very committed to keeping this ball rolling and taking it forward to COP27, which will be an African COP hosted by Egypt, where this issue of loss and damage will be given the seriousness that it deserves, that the COP26 presidency simply did not do. They abdicated their responsibility of dealing with the seriousness of this issue. Uh, and, and in my view, that was a big, big failure as far as I'm concerned. They can point to a lot of small uh, good things. I'm, I'm happy to appreciate those small good things, but the one big th bad thing uh, simply drowns out all the little good things that they might want to claim credit for. Thank you. Thank you, Salam. Uh, um, Salim, that was really interesting um, as well, especially around uh, the Nicola Sturgeon um, aspect that you brought in. And I maybe can add, add very quickly that she has also ended now the discussion around the Campo oil field. So she's made the decision that this exactly. will not go ahead, which has already been challenged in Scotland and um, in the UK. So it's not an easy task for her, but uh, she has, you know, come to some consequence, come consequential decisions after um, attending COP26. Now I will give the floor now to uh, Amir straight away. Thank you, Amir. Um, hello, everyone, and an honor to be on a panel of such distinction. Um, hard to follow Levania and Salim. Uh, I'm going to start, I'm ever the mediator, I'm told, in my life. So I'm going to start by saying everything that they say is true of my perception. So I function as advisor to the chair of the least developed countries. And specifically, I'm going to speak a little bit about Article 6 and then move to my second hat. I'll do them very, very briefly, as I'm aware that uh, brevity is, is the biggest virtue. Um, I completely agree that unfairness has been baked in into the interpretation and the rule book, of course. And I agree with Salim that counting the Santiago network, which uh, Alok Sharma did several times as a, an achievement of COP26 is not necessarily a true reflection of what that was and could have gone further. Um, I'm going to try and indicate how that unfairness is also baked into Article 6 technical 
thinking, not only, but definitely um, specifically around adaptation. But what I want to do after that is continue to both optimism, which I realize is an unusual note to have, and to the duty to act from here. So having given that rather long introduction, I'll, I'll try and be a bit faster. So in terms of Article 6, beyond the suicidal level of the amount of pages that were released and had to be read and reread and the interconnections and how they're related and what most people don't really want to know, I guess, the important things we need to know is that there are now two types of units or credits, and that there is a transfer of credits. And, and they're not the most important because obviously share of proceeds for adaptation is vital and I'm gonna to get to that. And overall mitigation of global emissions is vital and I'm gonna to get to that as well as our baselines, which I'm not gonna to touch because people will fall asleep and go home. Um, so starting with transfer of units. So why do I say that the least developed countries and this unfairness was baked in, obviously, uh, developing countries aren't a, one block of countries and there are more and less developed within them and there are different interests within them and they are the majority of the world <clears throat> and shouldn't be treated as one block but what has happened here was at least in terms of our group is that there's been an approval for the transfer of units at the insistence of China um, and Brazil presumably and units generated significantly earlier than they would have been from the Kyoto Protocol, so from the uh, clean development mechanism. The problem with that is obviously the lack of corresponding adjustments. Uh, there's been a lot of research, a lot of it issued uh, on behalf of the least developed countries and ILAC and a few other groups, stating the danger and the damage that that will do to the planet. And it is an incredibly disappointing outcome. The second disappointing outcome has to do with the voluntary carbon markets. There is, throughout and without going through all of the details, there was a discussion about authorized and unauthorized units and what you can do with authorized units and what you can do with unauthorized units. And our attempt in fighting a, a retreating battle to this was to say, well, that shouldn't be, but if it is, you should definitely define what not authorized is so that we can identify them. And if you can't define what it is, then you have to define a mechanism and so on. And in most of that, we lost. So in most of that, what you have is you're going to have is very profitable potential derivatives for the voluntary carbon markets that will be terrible for the planet and terrible for the finance of the countries that truly need them. So in that sense, um, a loss. And the third point is overall mitigation of global emissions, which are essentially means, yes, this is meant to promote the long-term temperature goal of the Paris Agreement, but we don't trust markets to do that alone. So you have to cancel units every time you purchase them. And our suggestion was 30% across both 6.2 and 6.4. It was not accepted across both as, as mandatory and it was 2% instead of 30%. And that brings us finally to a uh, share of proceeds, which Levania has already mentioned, and the fact that it is voluntary um, in 6.2, strongly encouraged is not significantly stronger than encouraged and I'm not sure why that was even a battle to enter in terms of language or at least there's a part of me that isn't sure and this is this is where I lead or try to create an elegant segue which is always difficult when you're doing technicalities of international law. Article 6 was part of the rule book and there's a separate significance to the ceiling of the rule book. The rule book itself in totality I cannot remember I think is around 200 pages which seems like a lot but for 190, well, between 93 and 97 jurisdictions in every subject in the world is obviously merely a sketch. And what there was and what could be seen in the cover decision is very much a passing of the baton, which is why there is an open uh, date for the applic for renewal of your NDCs, which is why the synth report needs to be an annual thing, because it passes an element of the power to either state or non-state actors. And there were much more, there was much more presence of non-state actors within this COP and I believe within the next steps. And this is where sort of I try to insert a note of optimism and take of my other hat as, as an NGO that has to do with ESG um, disclosure and our duty going forward. And I think that the rule book is like Plato at this stage. It's been given to us, we now have a rule book and we're instructed to play and we have to and we have to move forward. But law is determined by usage and that's where we have to keep our eyes open. We have to keep our eyes open and, and this is 
in the sense of where I think non-state actors and state actors, but I'm going to ignore nation states for a second because I believe they're built up of the non-state actors. Um, non-state actors will be the ones determining if this rule book is used for good or bad. If the credits transferred uh, from, for example, the CDM or if the unauthorized units are used or not incentivized or disincentivized. And we're given that opportunity to take the step, the step forward. The biggest failure, the biggest, I guess I can use the word deceit or differentiation between the cover section of COP26 and the technicality is one paragraph that says, are aware or recalls the need for consistent certain adaptation finance saying that in the cover section and then refusing to have it installed within article six is exactly the gap where we now have to step into and i say that in a tone of hope um, where it comes to disclosure for the corporate sector or for cities and states we have to learn exactly what the lines are and we have to do that whether it's through academia or through civil society what the lines are for good usage of article six we have to start defining what worthy finance is, and that includes finance for adaptation. There is a lot of an understanding now and a lot of a discussion in the private sector and ways to incentivize that finance for adaptation and finance for loss and damage is not apparently going to come from where it should. And acknowledging that we have to start redefining those lines. Um, we have to start creating a basket of incentives in the private sector as well, that will say where adaptation ends into baskets that are incentivized much like all all uh, science-based alignment is and has to be redefined again we have to do the same for loss and damage and those are questions that I'm, I'm on this panel also to ask those questions i was asked recently how could the private sector describe a contribution to loss and damage is it in terms of enabling cultural rights but the tone of hope for me is that we are given this plato and we are given the capacity to take those first steps and hopefully design it. And that I think is in spirit of the way that the Paris Agreement itself was originally designed as a combination of you should, because we know someone else is gonna take this up and you shall, because this is the bare minimum. And I think that if I may, my own personal opinion that has to do with my endless optimism, which I've been both criticized and I hope cared for for is Every country and every citizen and everyone on this call has complained about their political system. And an expectation of the international system comprising a discussion of nearly 200 people of limited capacity of a political system that has to be compromised itself, arriving at an end goal is always going to be a crippling disappointment. And worse, it's gonna stop us from doing what we have to do to step up. And I think that they have taken it as far in a terrible, disastrous way as they could, but that there is hope for us to take this forward without attributing as much importance anymore to the UNFCCC as the only source of progress. I hope that makes sense. I have so many questions to many of the other uh, panelists and people listening. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amia. And I'm also guilty of having so many questions. And that's why I didn't even take the time to introduce you and Salim. So just for everyone again recalling, so Salim is the director of ICAT. And for everyone who's attended this lecture series will know that as well. And Amia, of course, is coming um, new to us now in, into this series, which is absolutely great. And I'm very um, grateful that you're doing this. And he's wearing two hats. So one is as uh, associate director of CDP and the other hat is the legal advisor function to the chair of the LDCs. And I think we've heard from both perspectives uh, and that was very informative and uh, I've learned a lot. So thank you so much for that. Um, I've got now um, Stephen next, if that's okay. And then after I was uh, Christina. And over the floor. So Stephen uh, has also been part of this lecture series. He is associate um, professor at Peking University and the chair of the Technology Executive Committee under the Paris Agreement. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Petra. And indeed, uh, um, in Amir, we have another very tough act to follow, perhaps new to the series, but uh, a very old and valued colleague. Uh, so I, I'm going to speak mostly about means of implementation, technology, finance, but I do just briefly want to reflect on the Article 6 market mechanisms, which, which Amir introduced so well. 
And I think the, the difficulty of the compromise amongst almost 200 parties uh, really answers the question of why we have the outcomes that we have. Um, there were certain parties which had a long-standing commitment to environmental integrity, uh, to designing these uh, mechanisms in such a way that uh, a perfect uh, design would have it. But ultimately, compromise was necessary. And that compromise we can see in terms of the role of uh, CERs, uh, CDM credits, uh, but also in terms of some of the other design features that have been mentioned. So I think um, we have these mechanisms now. Uh, the key thing is to make the best possible use of them. And I fully agree uh, that is not just referring to states, but also to market actors. Um, on the positive side of the ledger, I, I would note that the fact uh, that human rights uh, and indeed the rights of affected communities, indigenous peoples have been built into both mechanisms is I think a positive. Uh, it's also positive that we see in the article 6.4 mechanism a um, provision for a grievance process of some kind. Uh, so it's entirely possible that uh, these mechanisms will represent an improvement from the Kyoto era. Uh, the other different thing, of course, is that they're landing in an entirely different context. If we think about where the business and investment community was back in 2005, uh, compared to where it is now in terms of climate, sustainable finance, et cetera, it's an entirely new world. So it's the context around it has changed. Um, the only other thing I'd say about these uh, two uh, mechanisms, the cooperative approaches and Article 6.4, is of course the work is still not done. Uh, there's a lot of additional work that the subsidiary body on uh, scientific and technological advice has to do. There's a lot of work that this new supervisory body uh, for the 6.4 mechanism has to do. So yes, we have the Paris rule book, uh, but there's some additional work to be done. Now, on the topic of means of implementation, finance, technology, and capacity building, this was an extremely busy uh, COP. On the side of finance, I think we have a number of outcomes that we can defend as, as progress uh, that are responding to the needs of countries. Uh, in terms of the Climate Technology Center and Network, uh, which, of course, provides technical assistance to developing countries, amongst other services. Uh, we were able to agree to extend its work for five years, uh, extending the COPS agreement with UNEP as the host of the CTCN. Uh, so that work will continue. Uh, we've also, I think, uh, continued to draw attention to the needs to adequately and sustainably fund the CTCN as well as to diversify its funding. Uh, there were a number of new funding announcements at the COP, and clearly that work uh, continues. Uh, also in terms of the governance of the CTCN, uh, what I was very pleased about was that we updated its advisory board uh, to include seats for Indigenous peoples, women and gender, and youth constituencies. Uh, so these three constituencies representing very important social movements that have really driven the politics of climate change in recent years will now have a direct role in climate technology governance. I think that that's something that uh, a lot of parties were very enthusiastic about. And obviously, in the end, we got a consensus, even if not everybody was enthusiastic about. In terms of the broader work of the CTCN and the Technology Executive Committee, uh, we had, of course, the COP recognizing the process on gender equality, gender responsiveness on the side of the tech, and also asking these two bodies to collaborate more closely. And indeed, the, the CMA has asked the two bodies uh, to consider the development of a joint program uh, building on the first ever joint uh, activities of the two bodies. So you have here uh, a delivery body, the CTCN, but also a body in the tech that provides advice recommendations to the COP. And the COP is asking the policy body and the delivery body to work more closely together. And I think that that's a positive. Uh, we've also seen the COP and the CMA asking the financial uh, operating entities, the GCF and the Global Environment Facility, uh, to work with the technology mechanism. So we're seeing these additional signals for more joined up work 
uh, by the delivery uh, bodies of the uh, Convention and the Paris Agreement. Uh, also on finance, and since adaptation finance has been mentioned, I, I think another important outstanding element of work that Glasgow resolved was the adaptation fund and particularly the eligibility for funding of the adaptation fund now that it is also serving the Paris Agreement uh, as well as the Kyoto Protocol uh, confirming that developing countries vulnerable to, to climate change who are parties to the Paris Agreement are eligible for funding and also uh, its board composition again open to parties of the Paris Agreement, as well as the uh, Kyoto Protocol. And of course, the thing about the Adaptation Fund, which is different to other bodies, is that it is going to transition to serving exclusively the Paris Agreement uh, once the share of proceeds has been established. So that agreement on Article 6.4 is important also for the future of the Adaptation Fund, not just for the setting up of this new mechanism. Uh, so a number of technical developments there uh, that, again, are not on any front pages at all, uh, but which I think show that the COP is functioning in the sense of the machinery of the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Now, of course, it's up to parties how ambitious that is. It's not up to these particular bodies. Uh, but these bodies are functioning and they're functioning under that guidance. Uh, the additional thing about finance, which I'll mention, is that the broader transition of finance flows to be consistent with uh, climate mitigation and adaptation, uh, of course, is in Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement as one of the Paris aims. It wasn't really on the agenda in any uh, detailed way at the COP, uh, but we did see a number of very important announcements outside of the negotiating room uh, that are trying to work towards that. So that's a question, I suppose, to colleagues, but also more broadly to parties. To what extent do we want this 2-1-C uh, track to be captured and managed in the negotiating rooms themselves? Or do we want to leave this to the sort of broader action agenda outside them? And a final point, again, just because it hasn't been mentioned yet, is that uh, the preparations for the global stock take are very much underway. And the co-facilitators of the stock take, uh, of course, were meeting in Glasgow with all the various bodies which were obliged to produce reports. So uh, the GST is a massive undertaking and, and it's now um, underway in a very real sense. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Very insightful and interesting. Um, and I think some of these questions probably tie in with uh, projects that ARMY is undertaking for CDP when we talk about the discussion about the uh, finance flows uh, that are aligned with the Paris Agreement temperature target. Uh, so thank you very much for that. I'm handing over now to Christina, who has also been um, playing a great part in this lecture series and is in fact um, co-organizing this entire series and she is a professor of law at the University of Oslo and also the chair of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law and the co-chair of the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee and the floor is yours Christina. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, Petra for, for organizing this whole day of reflections. Uh, and on behalf of the IOCN World Commission on Environmental Law, of course, I would just like to uh, second you in, in welcoming everyone. And I'm really, really glad that, that we are able to, to do this because the lecture series built up to the COP and now being here, being together and taking stock of what actually happened and also having this uh, excellent vantage point of, of talking uh, with the relevant experts in those fields is, is an incredible um, opportunity. So th thank you so much for that. And it's also good to see you. Some of you I, I saw at the COP even just fleeting. <laughs> so I apologize for, for any only very, very brief moment of encounter, but it was a, it was a um, hectic two weeks. Um, if I would like to share some reflections on the overall um, outcome, and then um, I focus a little bit more on on uh, the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee. 
before I went to Glasgow uh, and I was watching the expectations towards the COP rising and rising and rising, I, I actually was very skeptical. I thought the expectations are so exaggerated that this COP can never ever <laughs> deliver on it. Um, in terms of um, the media focusing on it, in terms of inviting heads of state, um, in terms of all the declarations that were planned that would come out in addition to the formal negotiation outcome. And uh, I have to say that by the end of the day, I was positively surprised that all kind of fell into place <laughs> in the end. And it did deliver uh, a fairly good outcome, but I also, of course, uh, um, agree with everything that has been said before by Lavanya and Salim and Amir and, and Stephen uh, about the, um, positive sides, but also the significant um, shortcomings. Um, I agree fully with Lavanya that in my view, the most important outcome is the finalization of the rule book. If only for the, this is, because this is now the, 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 the green light, the get go for implementing the Paris Agreement. There is no excuse possible anymore by anyone saying that we still have to do this, we still have to agree on that before we can start effectively implementing. That's not possible anymore. Everything is there. And I think that's a very, very important signal, even though there are bits and pieces that still need further work, um, but that, that excuse cannot be um, held. And I think for all of those that care about Paris, that care about real and effective action on climate change, that, that, is, that is a major um, success. We've already spoken about Article 6, and I don't want to delve into any detail. I was, in the end, unexpectedly thrown into the, the, the trenches there when, when forests made their way into the discussions on Article 6. That was a long time coming. Um, but it wasn't quite expected to be that pronounced in the end. <clears throat> but just just one or two words on on forests because it became so controversial in the end. <clears throat> forests were always part and parcel of Article Six. Uh, they were always included. <clears throat> I'm sorry, in the word removals, and removals have been there for a long time. Just the explicit reference to forests, or in particular, Red Plus was something that was met with a significant amount of skepticism and opposition for, for very uh, good reasons of environmental integrity. But it doesn't mean that forests are uh, not included. They are part and parcel of article, both Article 2 and Article uh, 6, 2 and Article 6, 4. What is important, in my view, is that we ha now have language um, with regard to environmental and social safeguards around removal activities, because this is where actually land activities come in. This is where um, um, indigenous people's rights, tenure rights, um, other, other social interests uh, can very quickly be effective, very directly. And we know this all from Red Plus. So having now a work stream on, um, on uh, uh, um, avoiding uh, negative environmental and social safeguards, in particular with regard to removals, but of course applies to all activities under six score, uh, under the new uh, supervisory body is in my view, a very important um, aspect. Another one is the general reference to human rights language. That was of course um, uh, something that was discussed very, very, uh, um, uh, uh, it was a very difficult discussion, but it, it uh, survived. And it's very interesting to see just the reference to, to the preamble of the Paris Agreement being now repeated everywhere. That was in itself uh, a difficult negotiation back in 2015, but also more specific references to indigenous peoples and local communities' um, um, rights. I also agree with uh, what Stephen said about the inclusion of a grievance. Um, whatever it is, a me mechanism or possibility. But in addition, there is also an appeal uh, possibility. It's the same paragraph. There seem to be two different things. It's not quite clear how this is in the end gonna, gonna work. There is more work to be done. But, um, but these, are, these are important aspects that, that are linking to um, a very important legal uh, um, scope or legal questions with regard to Article 6, uh, 2 and Article 6, 4, which will in the future years require further work and are definitely a place to watch 
um, for lawyers uh, because these these will still have to be developed. Um, with regard to transparency, of course, I think these are the least sexy parts of the outcome, which the media did not spend any time on, which I think are the most important thing that we have all these tables now in, in place for um, the biennial transparency reports and all the different elements in the biennial transparency reports is absolutely crucial. We wouldn't be able, parties wouldn't be able to report their BTRs every other year from 2024 onwards if those tables were not in place. So these uh, common reporting formats, common um, uh, um, uh, transparency um, uh, 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 tables are absolutely crucial, exactly the same for the outline of the um, technical expert review um, report. But as I said, this was something that media did not focus on, but these are these are prerequisites for pairs uh, to function. Common timeframes, I'm not so sure what we got there. It's a bit of a um, mixed, mixed uh, uh, bag. Of course, there is an indication now that's every five years, but it is an encouragement. Uh, for parties to do so, which still leaves, of course, room for parties to do something different if they want to. I've seen the text evolving uh, up and down throughout the two weeks, and there were different options. In the end, it fell back to one. I think it's, it's the shortest CMA decision I've ever seen. Um, it's just one sentence um, or two. Uh, it's just an encouragement to, to five years, and we still have to see how this plays out and how parties react to that encouragement. It leaves still a lot of discretion for them to do otherwise. Uh, I personally would have preferred to see a much more uh, stringent language there, but it wasn't possible. Another uh, element which completely flies under the radar is that parties actually agreed on the use of the public registry. And I say this because this links directly to the compliance committee. Um, until this decision from the CMA, you may know that the uh, secretariat was used to establish an interim registry where the uh, NDCs were being um, um, reported. And now this is gonna be transitioned into the public registry. But for the compliance committee, it will be important to use the public registry because that's the formal channel to check whether parties do or do not have uh, an NDC. As long as it was an interim registry, it wasn't that formal channel that the compliance committee was asked to use to check on that information. So it's a tiny little detail, like many things, but it is important for the smooth functioning of many different aspects under the um, peers agreement. Um, on the cover decisions, uh, I also agree with, with much that has been said. Um, I think it is an important signal that the machinery of the Paris Agreement moves forward, is flexible, but based on the general building blocks of the Paris Agreement, but it, it changes a little bit, like, like Lavagna um, uh, indicated, it changes a little bit the, the parameters, it, it moves the timeline for net zero earlier to 2050, it moves the focus from well below 2 to 1.5. These are important um, signals, but that's what they are, they're signals. Uh, it's it's not a mandatory language as as we know. Um, I think uh, in addition to the elements that that Lavania mentioned, what is important is the connection between NDCs and long term strategies. Um, that was something long term strategies were supposed to be communicated last year. Very few parties did, and it was never quite clear what they were and how they related to the NDCs and also these midterm pledges. Now, I think having um, an encouragement or whatever it is, a request, <laughs> I can't remember right now, to connect uh, the NDCs, the five year NDCs, let's see if they're five years to the uh, midterm long term uh, midterm um, uh, uh, strategies is a very important signal that they have to be uh, looked upon um, in in conjunction and cannot just be different different elements but there has to be some logical uh, connection between these these elements finally on the cover decisions um, well two words first of all it was very interesting to watch which governing body is adopting which cover decision uh, with which <laughs> content, as you perhaps seen one CMA one, uh, one CMA three and one CP 26 are in many parts similar, and then they are different. And it was a very uh, interesting legal discussion of what would have to go in which cover decision. And, and for the law, I mean, we as lawyers, it, it's actually very interesting to analyze 
um, the pairs related aspects in the cop cover decisions, <laughs> what, what are they supposed, what, what kind of message, what kind of legal implications do we have uh, by the COP adopting uh, issues relevant to pairs, um, not necessarily vice versa, there's, there's very little in there, but it, it was a legal um, discussion there that, that was of, of interest. Um, and the final thing is the recognition of the importance of nature, forest, biodiversity, seeing it in an integrated manner, as we now have in paragraphs 21 and 38, respectively, in the COP and the CMA decision. We have language there on, on uh, forest protection, reserva uh, uh, conservation, and so forth that we've never had before in the context of the uh, climate um, treaties where we also see that the, the world of biodiversity protection of ecosystems and climate change is growing closer together. It's still an uphill battle. It's still difficult, but it's something that has to be seen much more in conjunction than we've done ever before. And if you allow me two, more, two, two words on the compliance uh, committee and I'll, I'll round up there. Um, the Paris Agreement Compliance Committee and see Salam is here amongst uh, um, us as well met actually for the very first time in person, although informally in, in Glasgow on the very first day on, on November 1st. The committee has been working online exclusively for the last two years. We've never had the chance to meet in person. So it was a very important possibility for the committee to avail itself of, of actually sitting in a room together and meeting in person. There were two online participants, but we were quite, quite a number of, of committee members. Um, the CMR also elected um, new members at the at the meeting. Uh, Twelve members were elected, which was important because the first elections for half of the committee were for only two years, and that ran out at the COP in in Glasgow. The CMA also adopted the first batch of the rules of procedures for the uh, compliance committee. Very very important because these are rules on the transparency of the meetings on voting procedures, on electronic voting, on roles of the co-chairs, on uh, conflict of interest, on confidentiality requirements and so forth, which are really crucially important for the committee to work um, uh, in the future and, and to also start its, um, its substantive work. But this is only one half of the mandate on uh, preparing the rules of uh, procedure we couldn't finish. And so the mandate of the committee was extended for yet another year to finalize the remaining part of its procedural rules. Um, and finally, the um, one aspect I wanted to highlight is the link to the, um, um, to the transparency framework. Um, as maybe you do know, do not know that the, the compliance committee has a link to the outcome of the technical expert review reports. Um, in, on issues of significant and persistent inconsistency with the reporting requirements. And it wasn't quite clear who, who does make this adjust, uh, that judgment on what is significant and persistent. And it is decided now fairly clearly that this is the committee who does that, but in its um, um, elaborations, it is invited to um, liaise with lead reviewers, um, members of the technical expert review teams, in order to get an understanding of when can we actually talk about persistent or significant inconsistencies. And that should enable then also the committee to uh, um, establish its own understanding uh, over time of, of how this link can be operationalized. I stop here before I speak too long, but um, I'm looking forward to, to other comments. Thank you. Thank you. So, <clears throat> sorry. Thank you so much, Christina. I could have listened for longer. So it was great. <laughs> Very insightful and it was lovely to see you as well. I think you've been extremely busy uh, running so many events and all at the same time. Um, so thank you for this contribution. And now I'm really glad to introduce uh, Nilufa Ura, who is, of course, also co-organizer of this series um, as director of uh, the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore. And and I'm also delighted that while we were all busy at COP, and Nilofa was also busy observing, of course, what's going on at COP, she was also re-elected as UNILC member, which I think is absolutely fascinating, I know. So we should celebrate. So it's a real honor to have you amongst us. Um, and I'm looking forward to your contribution, Nilofa. Well, thank you so much, Petra. And, and let me... Uh, 
thank you for all the work you've put into the series. You have really been uh, the heavy um, uh, weightlifter in this. And so I thank you uh, and also Christina as well. I think it's been a very successful series. And I have to say that um, this um, uh, reflection that we're having today of the COP26 uh, by outstanding experts um, has shown that the series really uh, lived up beyond our expectations. And listening to everyone, I have learned a great deal because unfortunately, I was not able to be at the COP um, and not follow it as closely as I would have liked to. But just in this time we've had together, uh, the insights um, have given me much to think about. I'm gonna go back and look at um, the outcomes with all of this in mind. Um, so I wanna thank um, my dear colleagues and panelists uh, for their uh, important contribution to the series and also to today. My focus is going to be quite limited and, um, and based on my lecture for this series, which was on the ocean, <laughs> this is my area of interest. And indeed, it's a topic that we've taken up in the International Law Commission, sea level rise. So I have to say, I listened very carefully to Salim's uh, loss and damage, uh, very related issues. So I want to follow this aspect very closely. I think the issues of equity um, uh, are, are absolutely critical. Now, there, without question, the climate change regime, the COP system uh, from UFCCC to Paris, um, now these, this agreement, the pact, it is the most, I will say, the most complicated regime. Um, and absolutely, we were talking about some, you know, 200 uh, parties engaged in this. It is pretty remarkable that even though they go over time by about one day, once they went two days, um, at the end, something does come out. And of course it will be imperfect uh, because it's a compromise. Now, from the perspective of the ocean though, um, what I have focused on was the ocean is somewhat limited, has a very limited place in the climate change regime. Um, in UNFCCC, you see it as a sink and reservoir, a functional role. Um, but science at the time, in fact, I mean, sea level rise was known at the time, but the scientific information over the years has informed us that the ocean is suffering from um, particularly carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and we know this, for example, ocean acidification, but, but ocean warming, uh, very uh, serious, um, all kinds of adverse impacts on the ocean, of course, marine life. But this has not really been reflected. Um, now, over the years, there has been a very strong growing ocean community voice uh, and really working hard to streamline uh, ocean issues into the COP process. Not an easy process. It's very difficult. The first attempt was made in Paris. Um, and, and, and I know personally, because at the time I was a negotiator, um, that there was, I would say, almost fear that the ocean issue would derail uh, the, sent the very delicate um, negotiations going on, uh, but it did end up in the preamble. And so I know that in the, uh, the um, Glasgow uh, Pact um, that uh, the language has been reflected again in the preamble. Now, the hope though, was to have ocean more expressly streamlined into the processes of the um, um, uh, Paris regime, or I, I guess at this point, I'm just gonna say the climate change regime. And in what I see from the decision that's come out, there is some progress. So it depends, you want to look at it either as half empty or half full. Um, and the progress is that we do have now um, a paragraph and I'm not gonna go into the preamble. I know um, uh, there's reference in the preamble, although I do know that the preambular reference has also included cryosphere and that was not in uh, the Paris preamble. Um, and I know that the preamble also has gone further and, and um, recognizing the, the 
need also the critical role of protecting, conserving, and restoring nature and ecosystems. And of course, this would include the ocean, no question. But the key for me, um, and this is, I think, was hailed by all the ocean advocates, was the language in paragraph 60 um, inviting the relevant work programs and constituted bodies under the UNFCCC to consider how to integrate and strengthen ocean-based activities in their existing mandates and work plans, and then, then to report these activities within the existing reporting process. And also to continue what were deemed to be quite successful, the annual dialogues that were chaired by the subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice, uh, and I believe also SBI, and they make an informal summary report. The question is, is this enough? Uh, for me, we have in two years, um, the global stock take, and this is going to be an, a, an absolutely critical milestone in this process that was started under the Paris Agreement. So here the decision is under the UNFCCC, how this will spill over at all um, into the process that's ongoing for the global stock take. Um, and here I think I'm going to join with Amir. Um, there's a huge role for um, non-state actors to really, so far the ocean issue is being pushed because of them. And not so much by, there's some uh, obviously states that have been very vocal in this. Um, so there's some progress, um, but I think there has to be more. And I think that the ocean issues have to be included formally in the processes, the technical dialogue that will be taking on, uh, happening um, within the global stock take process, the information gathering, all the high level dialogues that will take place. I think that this will be a, an important, a real advancement, not just lip service, um, because we have to recognize that you cannot, you cannot separate the ocean from the climate system. It's part of it and it has to be integrated. Um, so anyway, so there's some improvement there, but there's much more that needs to be done. And I hope to be, you know, um, uh, seeing advancement uh, on this. So I'll stop right here and look forward to the continued discussion. Thank you so much, Nirufa. Absolutely interesting. And I think, yeah, I would absolutely agree that the ocean should be taken a bit more serious, given that they also have only a very limited capacity to absorb um, emissions uh, uh, from now on. Um, now, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I might use my privilege as moderator to ask a question here, actually two. One is in relation to the um, COP uh, cover decision or the Glasgow Climate Pact, as it's called. Um, and as you know, those of us who had the privilege to observe the last plenary know that there was quite an emotional scene when all of a sudden the um, India stood up and asked for an amendment to the text. And immediately afterwards, it was portrayed as, you know, the powerful states making uh, a difference to the outcome at the very last minute out of the rules of procedure. Uh, and I know this has all happened before, but I'm also wondering whether the narrative is quite correct here, because um, on the Wednesday morning, I think there was nothing in this um, cover decision that qualified the subsidies to fossil fuel. It was, uh, there was no addition of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, but that of course was then introduced and then maybe that would be my explanation um, as a result of introducing a limitation on the um, subsidies. There was then um, a certain move by developing country states to say, well, we need to also uh, limit what we have to do and change phase out to phase down. I'm just wondering if you know there are some more insights because much of this has then happened behind closed doors, uh, whether there's someone who could give us a bit more insights on what happened behind these closed doors so that they was then changed between Wednesday and Friday and then again in the plenary. And my second question, if I just may, relates to um, the Article 6.2 rulebook and there to the review. Um, now, I, I understand paragraph 25 as excluding for the Article 6 technical expert review, uh, chapter 4, B, which would be the annual report. And I think that must be such an important facet of the overall transparency in terms of how do parties track and use um, the um, ITMOS. 
uh, that I was rather surprised to see that this is now all left to the secretariat and the consistency check of the secretariat instead of at least also a consistency check that the Article 6 review experts will perform for Chapter 4A and C. So that is the initial report, uh, but not the then annual report. So I was also wondering if we have some more expertise uh, on this. Thank you very much. Who wants to answer? <laughs> I see the Freddie has her hand up after that and Kathy, but um, I don't know who would like to answer uh, the first two questions and then we go to the next. Yes, Stephen. Yeah, look, on the intricacies of the reporting under 6.2, I might leave that to those who are actually in the room. Uh, if there's anybody here, uh, it's a bit, uh, well, to be honest, I'm not sure even if those who are in the room uh, would, would be able to answer that, but it's a very important question. On, on, the, on the cover decision, uh, I, I would just observe that a lot has been made of the intervention of India and China, and quite rightly, I think. Uh, but we should also not believe that these are the only countries amongst the parties present uh, who wanted to see changes um, to some of this language, both on subsidies, both on coal. Uh, there has long been a kind of unofficial friends of coal, which exists at the COP. Uh, and it's obviously not very good PR uh, to make these statements in plenary sessions anymore in 2021, but there are certain countries with certain interests who are still very much at the table. I think I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, it's it's probably something that is then um, as a reaction of, of certain states uh, almost to be predicted if you qualify which kind of subsidies you are willing as a developed nation to reduce, only those that are inefficient and no one knows who uh, holds the power to explain or to, to define what inefficient is, and then expect others to completely face out cold. So I think that maybe has to be seen together. Lavanya? Uh, thank you, Petra. Just to sort of follow up on what uh, Stephen was saying, um, there's certainly a coalition there. And I think we also need to see what's not in that paragraph. There is no oil, there's no gas. And I think that we had stronger blocking coalition for oil and gas than there obviously was for coal. So there is there is a sense that certain, um, that if not certain countries, but certain types of trajectories are being targeted more than others because of you know, the kind of blocking coalitions there would be for a wider fossil fuel sort of, uh, uh, sort of phase out, I guess. But in terms of um, India and China's interventions, I thought much of that reportage, media reportage afterwards was very unfair. Um, India, 70% uh, of India's electricity comes from coal. We're a developing nation. Uh, our per capita emissions are a quarter of, of the world uh, average. Um, and many, many still need, uh, we have energy poverty issues. This is not to say that we need to continue with coal and that we shouldn't move away, but we need, uh, we need to see what the IEA has said is that the kind of transformation that would require for India uh, to go get away from coal is unprecedented. No other country has done it and no other country will be able to do it without substantial support. And the IEA uh, estimates that to be $1.4 trillion by 2030. That is not what was on the table. $100 billion for all developing countries per year by 2020 has not yet been met. So I think we need to see this in context, asking countries to move away and to phase out coal in the context of absolutely no support a very limited support for, for those transitions, unprecedented transitions and transformations uh, is what we need to focus on. And that's part of what I was talking about, the baking in of unfairness and equity. I'm not suggesting we don't move away from coal, but I think, uh, I think sort of focusing just on language on phase out and phase down in the context, wider context of such limited support for these countries to transform their economies away from coal is what we should focus on. And I think we're missing that context when we just focus on phase out and phase down in terms of sort of language and composition. 
Sorry, I absolutely agree. That's what I tried to say. So I think the narrative here has to, to change and, and to change away from this focus on saying India and China have um, introduced the last minute change, but in fact, what happened before that made them uh, come to this move. And I also think that when India came into the negotiations with this target of 2017 net zero, whether that is greenhouse gas or another net zero target, I, I can't explain that. But just coming in with this signal, I think, was probably uh, then a missed opportunity then it, because it wasn't taken up by the developed countries in the sense of if they agree to that, then with more support, this can happen or maybe even happen sooner. So I think that was a bit, uh, yeah, maybe unfortunate outcome in the uh, negotiations. Um, and uh, Freddie, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a, a question about loss and damage, which I think is to to Salim and Amir and also uh, Christina. And I think I'll start with the Christina bit because you were saying that one of the key outcomes was the on the reporting and the tables. And um, this is just my, my ignorance. Does that just uh, contain mitigation or is there also reporting on, on adaptation in, in, when NDCs cover adaptation? And I guess that I would assume there's nothing on, on loss and damage because that's not really covered in, in NDCs, but would that be something that could be done in the future? Um, and uh, yeah, the, the other question is to, to Amir and um, Salim, um, because Salim, you tweeted after um, the loss and damage decision that we need to do more on loss and damage and we also need to do more research on loss and damage and so I just wondered in what um, what do you think is is really that is missing and that is needed to move forward um, and also and, and to Amir and uh, yeah same question but specifically to get that money or that from or that addressing of loss and damage from the non-state actors. So what what is is there something missing from the science? Uh, and if so, what 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 is it and how can we do it? Okay. So Amir, do you want to answer first? You've got your hands up, and then maybe Christina, if you also want to come in. Yeah. Um a melange of very quick answers with regards to the coal. I'll just say that the added interest in the room, which I think was alluded to but wasn't necessarily directly um, mentioned was the fact that the signal was meant to indicate to financing institutions that it is still legitimate for them to finance in the longer term than three years and that's sort of the reason for the changing of the wording and I think that was a shot in the foot and, and without going into the discussion with Levanya of, of whether or not that was a justified um, claim it obviously wasn't only China and India. Um, South Africa has a very, very active movement, I think, for many of the same reasons that it depends. It has 400 years of coal um, and it has steered many groups to support that position just in, in the names of eradication of poverty and, and, and energy poverty. Article 6.2 and reporting. I have created a very complicated graph of where one leads to the other, but I, I'm without following all of the arrows, your general conclusion is possible. What I see it as, and I'm happy to share that later, is um, there's a gap there that can be abused in terms of what is and isn't reported. And it, a lot of it, as Stephen quite rightly mentioned, depends on a lot of elaboration of how things are exactly going to be analyzed, who they're going to be analyzed, what the relationship is with the transparency reporting and what the relationship is. And Christina is going to answer that either this is completely not true or not, but in the room, there was a lot of attempts, all of which were foiled to relate this to, um, to Article 15, so to the Compliance Committee as well, in some very roundabout way. Um, so there are the intricacies of that. For Frederica, I do not compete, not with Christina, not with Salam about loss and damage. I'll say that for non-state actors, the current attempt, and I'm sad to say that it's not by many, but I hope that it grows, is to at first define and limit what it means, and then to try and find loss and damage as opposed to, so where does the line between loss and damage? And, and I know that this is defined, I'm not justifying this research, but this is these are the gaps that are claimed. 
Um, where does the line go between adaptation and loss and damage? And when it comes to loss and damage in itself, how can you define the finance stream in a way that they can then follow on? I know this sounds incredibly dull, but, but for non-state actors, once the finance stream is defined, going on to disclosing about it and incentivizing it becomes an easier issue. Um, having said that, with regards to reporting, you are free. I, if I'm not mistaken, you can report. You're not obligated to report. You're allowed to report other metrics. The second, it is better defined. The incentivization system will mean that that reporting will enter into it. Again, that's I'm aware that that is my optimism. And I know that I've answered lots of questions just slightly, so I'm sure that they will be added onto and, and uh, corrected with others. Thank you, Ami. So now I give Christina the floor to also relate to the question. And then I see Salim. Kafi has a new question. And then we've got Ibrahim with a new question. Um, yeah, maybe first to uh, Frider Friederike's uh, question on, on the, um, in particular, the common tabular formats for the biennial transparency report. And it, within the biennial transparency report, the, the progress report and the Article 13.7b. Um, I think here, if, if you look through the you know, the tables that we have, um, there are there are some rows which are fairly broad, and parties can put in um, additional information on policies, measures, circumstances, whatever they have, uh, and that is an avenue for um, affected parties to include uh, or to draw attention to certain challenges that they may be facing uh, in the implementation of NDC due to losses and damages they may already be occurring. There, there is a possibility there, however, that's gonna be used is a very individual um, uh, decision by each party to, to make uh, what it wants to draw to or bring to the intention of the global uh, community or, or not. But if you have a look at these table uh, um, outlines, there, there are some of these, um, that allow for broader information to be provided um, uh, through their binary transparency reports. There is also um, out, um, um, outlines for the or common tabular formats for the finance uh, obligations for developed country parties, finance, uh, technical, uh, um, uh, technology development and capacity building, where developed countries will have to put forward uh, their information every other year. Um, that is, of course, not an obligation for developing countries, but here we will have forthcoming uh, information on a biannual basis that will be uh, also indicating of, of uh, how much is being put forward um, uh, uh, on an individual uh, country basis, but will, of course, be able to be um, uh, uh, summed up then at some point in the global stock day. On the question that you had, Petra, um, and, and <laughs> I'm really keen to see Amir's <laughs> table because I have my table as well, and it is complicated. <laughs> where where does which information go and who reviews it and when does it actually get to the Article 13 uh, um, TRs? Um, but there is this link um, and it will work. Um, we'll, we'll make it work, I'm sure of that. Um, but both for the technical expert, re, uh, for the Article 2 reporting and the Article 2, two, uh, 6 to review, there's a direct link um, to the, to the um, uh, Article 13 uh, technical expert uh, review. And with that, there's also, of course, a link to Article 15, which did not need to be ex made explicit, but it's there through this link. And, and we made sure of this already in, in um in Katowice when we requested information, mandatory information and reports to be included. And then if mandatory information is missing and this Article 6.2 information is mandatory information, the, uh, um, the Compliance Committee could get um, active. Um, one aspect that I wanted to highlight is, <laughs> I forgot now, <laughs> I'll come back to it later, um, but uh, um, I'll just leave it at this right now. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that's really interesting that you think this will be covered because it still strikes me as a, as a gap there since, you know, A and C are mentioned, but B are not. So there's, you know, easily the argument then made that this is there for a reason. So it would be very interesting to see the tables. And I've had some questions in the chat that are also asking for the tables. So we will have to discuss how we can make uh, these available. Um, so thank you again for, for that. And I've got now Salim and then Kathy. Thank you very much, Petra. Thank you for that. 
question, uh, Frederica. <clears throat> so let me address the question about research on loss and damage, which you've raised. Um, and in fact, Amir has raised a number of what we call frequently asked questions about loss and damage, like what's the difference between adaptation and loss and damage? If we talk about money, where does it come from? Who manages it? Who gets it? And so on and so forth. Long list of questions. Uh, we plan to address those. Um, the day after the COP ended, uh, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon very kindly invited me to her residence in Edinburgh to talk about what to do. And we have agreed that there will be a research program where we will invite researchers from around the world to address each of these frequently asked questions, which we are currently collating together. And if any of you are interested in addressing any of them, uh, please do feel free to get in touch with me and uh, we will share them with you and invite you to uh, address them. Uh, the idea is to take these answers to these frequently asked questions to the next uh, series of dialogues and workshops, workshop under the SNLD, uh, and the dialogue under the cover decision uh, before COP27 in uh, Egypt next year, and then take these issues up at a, uh, a higher level there. And in the meantime, uh, solicit uh, coalitions of the willing who are willing to put some funding in to keep this ball rolling outside the UNFCC process because loss and damage is actually happening. Um, just to give you one sense of orders of magnitude of who uh, is paying the cost because people are paying the cost. For every thousand dollars cost of loss and damage, the people suffering the loss and damage are paying $990 of that cost out of their own pockets. These are the people who suffer loss and damage. $10 comes from their governments. It varies. A rich country gives them more than a poor country does. And only $1 out of 1,000 comes from the global humanitarian system. So that gives you the orders of magnitude involved in who is paying for loss and damage at the moment, because it's a reality and it's happening. Thank you very much, Salima. I think I'm not going too far in saying that you probably have a coalition of the willing here. So I could imagine that there are some colleagues here who would be very interested in joining you in this endeavor. Um, and uh, I give the floor now to Kathy. And after that, if Ibrahim wants to come in and ask his question, that's fine, or I will read it out. Thanks. And, um, and also, hi, everyone. Um, really great to see that such an interesting panel is put together. And um, and also a few of you may know me from following UNFCCC processes um, as from a youth and gender perspective. Um, yeah, so I, I had a clash for the first hour, but I heard the last point by Nilofer on oceans. And then personally, I'm quite interested in the nexus between oceans and constituted bodies. Um, so I guess it would be really great to hear from panelists in terms of if they see any further um, potential work by constituted bodies on oceans and how they uh, how they might join forces together. So specifically um, for Salem, I, I think the last time we met was at a PCCB event. Um, and so, and I remember Petra was also there in the audience. Um, so I think it would be really great to hear from you in terms of um, how work on oceans by the UNFCCC relates to capacity building and loss and damage. So including the XCOM and, um, and Stephen, obviously the tech works on oceans and and I believe with IUCN, AC, and Nairobi work program, if my memory is, is right. So would also love to hear for, from you. And um, and Christina, I, I know very little about the compliance committee, so whether the, the committee also works on oceans in any way. Um, and also if you any of you would see that um, the work by constituted bodies on oceans um, can relate to each other's work and also um, would benefit from civil society engagement. Thanks. Thank you very much. Now, I, I'm aware of the time, but I know we are nearing the time where maybe some of you have to leave. Um, if, if you can stay with us, that's great. We have actually um, shortened the time because we weren't quite sure about who can join us, who can't join us. So if we go a bit over time, we can still be here. Just wanted to make sure that I am aware of the time, uh, but I think we should take up this very important question as well. So for uh, all of those who can stay, who wants to answer first? Christina, do you want to? If I can just 
pick up on Kathy's question about the compliance committee having anything to do with oceans, um, perhaps um, potentially in an indirect manner. The, the mandate of the committee is to um, promote implementation and facilitate compliance, or the other way around, facilitate implementation and promote compliance. Um, and facilitate implementation means in general um, that, that it could support um, the implementation of parties' uh, commitments, including their NDCs under the, the Paris Agreement. So if a party wants to include ocean-related measures in its NDCs and faces challenges, in its implementation, um, there is a possibility to come to the committee and 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 seek um, seek support in, in 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 any particular given way. But this is only a potential avenue because because it's called implementation and compliance committee. The focus has been very much on that compliance bit, but it is actually a facilitative um, body uh, which could help addressing challenges that parties face and that that could be an, um, an example what exactly the committee would do in this context is something that would need to be found out I just wanted to highlight that it is um, an, an um, facilitative uh, implementation support body that that exists in addition to uh, to all the other uh, constituted bodies Thank you, Christine. And I'm not sure if Nilofa wants to come in or, or Stephen perhaps on the committee on this question. Was that, or is that a new aspect? Um, I'll let Stephen and then I'll just say a few words, but I, th I thought it was interesting. Kathy wanted to have a different perspective. So I'll, Stephen, you can go ahead. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks, Kathy, for the question and also your engagement in the technology mechanism. The uh, the new observer seats I mentioned on the advisory board before are very much that party decision builds on the advocacy of Kathy and her colleagues. So it's a terrific example of what uh, non-state actors can do in this process. Now, the tech indeed has been working on oceans. Uh, we produced last year together with the XCOM of the WIM, a report on uh, loss and damage in coastal zones and technology. Uh, this year, we have been collaborating with IUCN, the Nairobi Work Program, and the Friends of Ecosystem-Based Adaptation, and a series of events on um, ocean and coastal resilience. And indeed, the tech will be looking at further opportunities for collaboration next year. Uh, also participating in the ocean dialogue that Nilafra mentioned. Uh, so I think it's, it's a crucial area of work. It needs a lot more than events and reports but it's good to see it um, seeping into this uh, sprawling UN climate process at various angles. And I think we need more of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. I'll just jump in very uh, quickly on this, Kathy. I, I think that's wonderful that you have this very, very strong interest in ocean and the ocean climate nexus. We need a strong voices and in particularly the voices of the youth in this. And one thing about, and I go back to the global stock take, um, it is supposed to be country driven. So that means that, I mean, the global stock take, it seems like everything, the kitchen sink can go into it. It's, it's, if you want to see a complicated diagram on the UNFCCC website, <laughs> it's the global stock take diagram. So I think there's plenty of opportunities um, for the two bodies, SBI and SBSTA, but countries you know, need to bring it in. And there's a very strong coalition of states, but again, civil society has a very important role uh, in this. Um, so I think we really need to push it um, uh, and, and have it not be exactly as Stephen said, it's not enough to have these informal dialogues. Um, there's lots of that, lots of side events, but if we're really gonna get action on the oceans, it has to become integrated into the process formally. So um, so definitely, you know, keep keep working on this. Thank you, Nilofa. So I think if we now have Ibrahim and then Linda and answer those questions, and after that we will wrap up and whoever needs to leave now, I thank you for coming here for your contribution and this great discussion to be continued. Uh, but let's have now Ibrahim's uh, question, please, as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, it's my pleasure to, to, see, to participate today with, with you and with the distinguished scholars. I'm um, sorry if, if my, like, a bit, um, my internet uh, service is uh, just lagging a little bit. 
But my question is directly is uh, in regards to the transparency provisions. And considering that the scholars, um, they mentioned that uh, there were, um, uh, there was a little bit uh, development uh, in, within the COP26. So I'll, my question is, uh, at the present, how can a state party build its MRV system components in alignment with the provisions of the Paris World Book? Um, considering um, that many countries, they have submitted their second uh, NDCs recently. So if like a developing country just focus its measures on uh, an energy system, for example, uh, what kind of, of legal rules that the government should uh, take in consideration when it builds its MRV system? And what components could that MRV system also include? So yeah, this is my question, my question for yeah, thank you very much. It appears to me that this is a question really for Christina as the co-chair of the um, Implementation Compliance Committee. Christina, do you want to answer this question? Sorry, I have to admit I didn't quite understand, but but for, for technical uh, reasons, I didn't quite understand uh, or couldn't hear it. If, if you could just briefly repeat the core of your question it's I was in the chat as well christina if you want to read it it's in if, i think it's oh it's just um i don't know he just sent it to me i'm not sure i can forward it in the chat i read it out it's maybe that helps yeah uh, so he would like to know is there in, any new development coming from cop 26 on the rule book provisions for transparency and um, at present how can a state party build its uh, multilateral um, uh, verification system components in alignment with the provisions of the rule book for ndcs is it still flexible for a state to decide in this regard or are developing state needs um Con to consult the expert group. So do these states have to consult or can they consult an expert group? Um, there, there are quite a couple of different issues here and I, I defer to, to, to Stephen as well and probably you as well, um, Petra. In terms of developments on transparency, yes, 54 pages <laughs> of developments. It's a, it's a, it's a huge block of um, these tables, which I posted in the in the, in the chat if you're if you're interested um so that is that is um that is that is new and this is this is where parties will have to report uh, under the transparency framework as i said from 2024 onwards there is some provisions or possibilities for flexibility for developing countries that need it in light of their capacities that has been in a way institutionalized and operationalized in the context of these provisions but in general, it's a tool uh, meant to help parties because they have now very concrete rows and columns where they have to fill in numbers. So it, it should make it easier, although it's still quite a <laughs> task to report along all these lines. But it is something that gives, gives parties guidance. Um, but I think for the rest of the second part of the question, maybe I defer to some of the other experts. And by the way, I also see that Linda has had her hand up for a long time. <laughs> Uh, go ahead. I, I know. Um, I know we're running out of time. And Salim and Freddie and others who asked the question around research areas for loss and damage are, are gone. So I'm not sure that my my contribution is is going to uh, fall on the right ears. But I think we need to um, look at the decision on matters related to the Standing Committee on Finance. Um, the Standing Committee on Finance put out a report that uh, on determination of the needs of developing country parties. And in that report, it was recognized that um, there are challenges in deriving cost estimates um, for addressing loss and damage needs, and that parties are encouraged to, and non-state actors are encouraged to um, do more work on um, methodologies around determining needs for loss and damage. So within the uh, climate change process, there is a recognition that there, there more work needs to be done on estimating costs for addressing loss and damage. So 
in addition to uh, the initiative that Salim raised, there, there is encouragement to parties and non-state um, actors to continue working on um, methodologies for determining costs of L&D uh, loss and damage. So I think that um, it adds to or, or hope, hopefully um, addresses um, some of Freddie's questions around future areas or uh, research needs for loss and damage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. And I think that's an important point. Maybe we can focus this afternoon more on this point. And Freddie, of course, in the UK, based in the UK, will be able to join that session as well. I think it's a really important point you're raising here and saying that you know we need to have clarity on the figures for loss and damage and on the estimates in, in order to make a strong argument. Um, and, uh, and probably also around the question of when is the um, limit or the um, capacity uh, exceeded for uh, any adaptation measures, because that is the very last point where loss and damage becomes very relevant if countries don't have uh, the capacity to adapt to um, climate change. So I think that's a really interesting point, and I hope we can continue that discussion. Um, given that we are nine minutes over the time, and I had so uh, much of your time, and everyone had so much of your time already, um, I think we will wrap this up and I'm really grateful for all your contributions. It has worked really well, I, this interactive style and these questions. We probably could have gone on to the uh, next full hour, but uh, I know you have other plans as well. And so let me thank you again for this great um, session and I hope it was beneficial for all of you. And we will continue this in one way or the other in the next year. So please uh, bear with us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Petra. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye.